Hi, Allison. Thanks for joining. It's great to be here, Talia. And today we're talking, we'll, we'll talk about all kinds of things, I'm sure. Uh, but maybe let's start by you telling us a little bit about, uh, you know, what your current work is. Because I know it's, it's been evolving, well, like many of us throughout the pandemic, our work has evolved. But I think you did a very rapid pivot, <laughs> it seems so, from the outside. Yeah, I'm pinching myself. 2020, man. <laughs> like the 2020. A year, ago, a year ago, I had a clinic and I was marketing myself as the anti-stress, holistic anti-stress clinic naturopathic medicine, Chinese medicine, psychotherapy, and all of this. And I was a registered psychotherapist. And I pivoted to be transformational coaching. So I help people make massive changes really quickly through a combination of physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, and sexual practices. So we, we go in at all the levels and we make a shift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're go yeah. And do, is there one level that you start with or is there a whole umbrella of I start with the low-hanging fruit so to speak so if I'm working with someone one-on-one -on -one in a customized program I get to know them and then I see where I think it can get moving and that's where we go usually that's breath work transformational breath work we start breathing in this structured way with my amazing facilitator my team Morelos and that just starts to get the energy moving if you've got to cry you're gonna cry if you need to rage you're gonna rage want to connect to spirit you're going to connect to spirit and it starts mm -hmm. so you're starting yeah by tapping into the body and the yes. breath why the breath i mean i i know but i want to hear you say it i just want to know yeah <laughs> maybe i don't know actually well you know it's interesting you say it that way because i mean we know and also it never stops to amaze me how obvious and not obvious breath work is i mean people say to me i had no idea Right. Yeah. It's our life. Everything. I mean, I'm studying fractal anatomy right now, so I just see patterns everywhere. But everything is the inhale, the exhale. Everything. Expand, contract, run, rest, wake, sleep. Mm -hmm. And so as we become connected to the breath and we work with the breath, we're connected to life. Ours, yours everyone around us. It's so, so, so profound. Mm -hmm. What does it mean for someone who's got a contracted, shallow breath? Like somebody who's kind of, you know, like so many people are just breathing into like the top layer of the lungs. Just oh my God, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's so many pieces, but the overall, the generalization that I can say is that you're not feeling your feelings. Mm -hmm. And our culture is so scared of feelings. As a psychotherapist, I cannot tell you how many times in my office, people are apologizing to me for crying. Hmm. And I'm sure you see this too. And I'm like, I'm a psychotherapist. I have, like, I have stock in Kleenex. <laughs> I hear somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but we are programmed not to have feelings. Or they'll say things to me like, I promised myself I wouldn't cry this session. Hmm. This is your therapy. I'm right. And it's like, we're, yeah. Do you want to go get your dog? Yeah. And it's not so bad when we do. Hmm. Right? Right. And it's like often what's needed, like to just release the emotions that are pent up, that are blocking, that are preventing people from feeling positive emotions, deeper emotions. Exactly. I always say the extent to which you can feel sad is the extent to which you can feel joy. It's a muscle. It's the breath. The extent to which you can inhale is the extent to which you can exhale. So to have the full range is to be rich. It's to be alive. It's so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so you start with that, with just literally just breathing in life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Releasing whatever's stuck and it's kind of like, yeah, I, I think of it too, like appetite, like your, the ability to like take in air, same with like digest your food, digest experiences to actually be embodied and exist and, and, you know, so many people are like partially here. That's know. right. That's right. That's right. And actually what you're saying makes me think of orgasm too, that so often we will tight through 
through orgasm. Whereas if we breathe, we can actually have the experience of life and it can go through our whole body. Mm -hmm. And so breath is life, is orgasm, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. Right. If you can't breathe, how can you orgasm? <laughs> right. Yeah. I know. And oh, there's so much about that, right? It's just like allowing pleasure to, or allowing oneself to own pleasure. Like it first starts with being able to breathe, but even to set an intention to, to allow in something, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. And that's where power is, I feel like, especially as women, to, to enjoy ourselves. It's so subversive. Like, right. oh, a woman who's enjoying herself. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. And then it big yeah, right. <laughs> what that. do you do with that? Yeah, right. How did you decide to, like, pivot your, your practice? So you were starting off with, you know, psychotherapy, and then it became quite deep like really and I think you don't work with very many clients right you have a, a small group that you really deep dive with that's right well I had been on my own healing journey that started with psychotherapy and then evolved into a whole range of practices um, spiritual emotional sexual and as I expanded therapy felt like a container that was a bit small for me and I also, I could see the transformation that was possible, but talking once a week was not what was gonna get somebody there. I wanted to be able to bring them in and help them breathe and connect to spirit and connect to their bodies. And so bit by bit, it just felt out of alignment. And 2020 was one of those years where it's like, it's out of alignment, it's hurting. Right. <laughs> right? So it was time to leap. Right. Yeah, well, we were talking about that before we started recording, this idea of like just not being able to distract in the same ways during these lockdowns and, and just mm -hmm. being forced to completely transition how we're, how we're making a living. And then also all these things coming up, which I think a lot of people are having the experience of like we see it's framed as like, oh, you know, mental health crises are going up. And yeah, there's a lot more loneliness and unemployment and all these different things people are scared of getting sick but there's this deeper piece i think that there's so much more space for us to feel things yes yeah. and this is the opportunity i think mm -hmm. and what i see is there are people doing really beautiful work if they're able to take that opportunity mm -hmm. and some people are not able to and they need more support but if we can Hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. This is I'm pretty powerful. This is the time, yeah. While we're while we're not able to go to bars. <laughs> That's can, right. <laughs> you can join like a transformational in you know, self discovery group. <laughs> well, exactly. And while we don't have all the obligations, like I don't have to run around and do a thousand things. So it's like, oh, I get to choose. And I know what I choose. And my cat decided to join us and sing a song. <laughs> I'm like, I have a dog scratching and who's just barking. So we have lots of pets visiting this episode. I think it's, <laughs> we're going to keep it in the edits. <laughs> like, it's nature. It's like, yeah, Snow White with all Absolutely. the animals. <laughs> they can feel our, our naturalness in our conversation. Yeah, here they come. Exactly. Yeah, they, they should not be edited out. Um, and I want to, so I know that, that a big part of what you do is, is integration of psychedelic experiences. And mm -hmm. let's talk about that because that's a big thing. I mean, there's one podcast episode I have, um, with another ND where we talk about mostly microdosing and it's come up in other podcasts and it's definitely a big area in the realm of mental health and something I talk about, write about. And so it's so cool to see you actually like diving in and doing the integration work and yeah, let's talk about all of that because a lot of sure. people probably don't know what integration work would be right i love that question i adore that question this is really what i want to do with my work because i see people having the psychedelic experiences and not being able to make the bridge and i've had that experience myself with a couple medicines where i went so far and then i was like 
what? <laughs> totally. And so there's a few pieces. One is working with someone, and there's many great people you can work with who can choose the medicine and the dosage in a way that's um, going to be productive for you because there is such a thing as too much. And then when you, once you've had the experience and what I do facilitating the experience is I encourage emotional release and breath during the experience. So you're learning how to have a relationship with the medicine, your conscious self, what we call Allison and Talia, this person who goes about day-to-day -day life is learning to have an engagement with the cosmos. Mm. And then the integration work continues this. And it's partly mental, like, what, what do I do? How do I understand the world? What have I been conditioned to do versus what's truly me? Mm. Then there's emotional release, keeping those emotions flowing. I was reading this morning in the Gene Keys, like the individuated human is able to work with their own feelings. So there's not so much drama and tension all over the place. Mm. We just feel and move. Mm -hmm. and um, learning how to do that, mm -hmm. um, learning how to connect to spirit, learning how to take care of the physical body, learning how to move sexual energy. There's so much integration work that can be done to, to integrate all the power of that cosmological experience, I like to say, that pioneering exploration you go on into the daily life so that you become a very powerful person impacting the world in whatever beautiful way is yours to do. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people with deep trauma, I say, you know, in the world of, of, of trauma work, I think a lot of people are drawn to psychedelics because what I've experienced is that pe like we feel like there's something inside. We don't know how to access it. We don't know how to heal it. And, and so it's like, well, if I sort of outsource that process to a substance that other people are telling me has powerful effects, things like ayahuasca or, or psilocybin, like magic mm -hmm. mushrooms, then it's like, well, that sort of integration process or that healing process can kind of take place um, maybe almost in a passive way. Like there, it's sort of framed as like you take this substance, it takes you on a journey, you're, you're kind of healed. But then I think what a lot of people are finding is it's hard to make sense of all those, those stories that come up. Cause it's, there's a lot of images, there's a lot of emotional release. There's, but it, a lot of it is very out there, maybe very confusing. And then when you learn really big things, people can feel like, how do I connect this thing I know to be true now with my normal life? And you know, if I know that I can't work this job anymore, be in this marriage anymore, whatever it is, how do I make those steps? Exactly. And you need to be accompanied and you need to be accompanied, I think, by people who've done this work so that they can really understand where you're coming from to the extent anybody can really understand. But you can't go back to a traditional sort of teacher who's going to tell you, but um, good women don't do that. Like you can't because you're, you're now wild. <laughs> You've unleashed yeah. it. Out of the cage. <laughs> Yeah, you're out of the cage, but you can work with other people you, you trust who are out of the cage and, like you say, like put it together and become the powerful person that you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there, yeah, and like, I mean, going back to maybe a traditional practitioner who doesn't really understand these medicines, maybe like, okay, so you thought you were like inside the body of a tiger moving through the woods powerfully okay and you know trying to connect it maybe back to a model like okay so what internal family system is that or whatever you know <laughs> yeah exactly. and you know or like what's the cognitive belief around tigers and you're like it's not quite what's needed like if you're accessing there's actually uh so i if you heard of robin carhart harris he's a psychedelic researcher in London, I think in London, England, I think he's, he mostly focuses on psilocybin. Um, and he has, he's very interesting because he has all these theories around um, psychedelic medicines that are like kind of scientific, but very like process oriented, mechanism oriented. So I think he's really interesting because a lot of people, I don't know what you think about this, but a lot of people who lecture on psychedelics can, it can be very dry and boring, even, you know. 
They don't understand. <laughs> right? Yeah. They're like, they show they you graphs. <laughs> And even if they have personal experiences, it doesn't somehow sound interesting. I don't know. I've been to many conferences and, I've, and I'm kind of like yawning in the lectures. Like, why is this so boring? Um, maybe it's because talking about it doesn't do it justice. I don't know. But he talks about um, primary consciousness and secondary consciousness. Primary being our sort of like base like amygdala, animal, nature, being in existence, right-brained kind of thing. And then secondary consciousness being our like cognitive self, our, ident our identified self, um, the you know default mode network, the rumination brain, all that. And so he's like, a lot of psychotherapy exists in secondary consciousness where you're talking, you're relating from the ego and psychedelics are primary consciousness like you're tapping or it's shutting off that secondary consciousness and you're tapping right into this primordial self and so to do psychotherapy with secondary consciousness while you're really healing it from that primary consciousness place doesn't really work like you know so talking is often not gonna do it um but when you have somebody who's who can help you like align those two things, I think it makes a big difference. Yeah. Totally. And this is where the breath work and the core energetics, which is like a body psychotherapy that I do, this is where these things become really, really important mm. because they're like bridges. And then I think there is a place for a good conversation from time to time, but it, it, does, it, has, to, it has to bridge, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. So fast. Yeah, yeah. It's like you can't be living in two different worlds. Like you're banking no. and your ayahuasca ceremonies on the Yeah, way. and that'll that will make you crazy. Mm -hmm. Like it'll make you crazy. And some people talk about breakdowns, and I think that's part of what it is, is going too far without anything in the day-to-day -day world to support the emergence of who's coming out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and that's scary for a lot of people who are living inside of a I mean, to a point, I think we're all, that we're all have some sort of false self, like identified self, like the, the person, the, the persona, right? But when that persona is so far off from our true sense of self, like when somebody really feels like they're not in alignment with their day-to-day -day life, that can be really hard when you start to notice, yeah, that there's a huge gap. Yeah. Yeah. And yet I think we all need to be accompanied in these transitions by people who understand what it is to, to, to realize basically that we're in a bit of a game, that we've been told certain things we should do and that there's value to those things, but to live that way is exhausting and false. And the thing with psychedelics is it shows you that in one go as opposed to like little by little by little, it doesn't really do it like that. So, so that's why you need to be accompanied by people who right. walked this territory. Yeah, and so you sit with people while they're having the experience, like how does it work? Uh, yeah. I create a ceremonial container mm -hmm. um, and I call in the spirit of the medicine I'm working with mm -hmm. and um, I, I accompany them in whatever way and it looks different for everybody but sometimes it's more psychotherapeutic sometimes i do subconscious reprogramming where we work with affirmations mm -hmm. sometimes we work with sexual energy sometimes um it's more like cognitive it, it totally depends mm -hmm. but i do i as part of the whole process that i work on with someone i do accompany them through the ceremonies as well mm -hmm. and i want to say this intention is like the cornerstone of how I work. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what is the intention for the work? Mm -hmm. And we always come back to that. So people often have negative experiences, especially when they're young. And part of that is not being held and not having intention. So it's like taking a romp through the cosmos. Like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so like in the middle of a party mixed with booze. Like a lot of people have had that experience because it's, unfortunately they're like in that illicit substance category where people think of like party drugs and you're like that's not the right context mm -mm. 
And I love hearing, like I, I usually work with people in their late 30s, 40s, 50s, actually all the way up to 70s. And I love having an experience with them and them saying, oh yeah, that's a totally different thing. I get it now. Mm-hmm. It can be very productive even when we have the bad experiences early on, I think. Right. Yeah. And this is what they talk about, like set and setting, but the intention as well of like, what is our purpose here? And what are we going to use these experiences to direct us towards versus just like exploding open? Like you said. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, I think there's this interesting um, connect. So, you know, people will, t- so DMT is the active ingredient in I, one of the active ingredients in ayahuasca. Um, and so people, but when people experience DMT, they may say like, it's very fast. It, it doesn't make sense. It's just a lot of information. And then all of a sudden it shuts down and then you're back. Whereas the plant, and it seems like with all the plant, when you're taking the whole plant and all of the different constituents, there, it almost feels like a chaperone is taking you through mm-hmm. the experience that makes more sense. And then that you add, you know, a, a facilitator, a shaman or a therapist like you, who is adding another layer of chaperone to help guide. It's like you're, yeah, providing another layer, almost of safety or of, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like in some ways we can go a little deeper when we know we're held. Mm-hmm. So there's that safety there. Yeah. 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 And in general, for full doses, I, I don't think people should be doing that alone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know some people do, and, and you know, if we're experienced, that's one thing, but, but I, I do think it's really important that, that we have, at a minimum, somebody who agrees to be present. Mm-hmm. To take I consider. We, we got, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But even better, I think, if the sitter has training and knows how to work with energy and knows how to work with the psyche. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a great point about the energy work. I, I do a lot of exploration and experimentation and I have discovered that energy clearings while working with psilocybin are incredibly powerful. Mm. So I find that to be a really interesting putting together of modalities to put some shamanic work in with the traditional medicine can move something really fast. Like what do you see sort of come up? Like, when when someone's yeah someone will either say like my um my stomach feels bloated or my throat feels blocked or they'll say the same thing to me over and over again for like 15 minutes and i'll be like hmm and then i'll come in with a rattle and and move the energy and then it always moves it Mm -hmm. every single time like it just needs a little bit of moving through They'll, no, they'll notice it as a physical sensation and then maybe an emotion comes up and then yeah. There's mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah beautiful yeah it's like moving this blocked energy through the body mm-hmm. and, and really i think the goal of them is to become more natural like to become like our pets who seem to like this conversation a lot like they just do what they do when they do it yeah. and that's what the psychedelics are working towards so when we get blocked that's a sign that like oh we're, there's some tension there we're not moving naturally and we can we can move it through with energy work or with the help of the mushrooms and and then it's really beautiful and then yeah speaking of pets coco wants to join this conversation i'm just gonna let oh yeah (laughs) there we go (laughs) i let one dog in and kept the other one out so (laughs) right so it's like we're yeah, can you say more about that? It's like there's this, there's this, uh, this freedom that you're alluding to that they help us access, and you yeah. you mentioned that with the sexual energy as well. This, you know, this shame maybe that holds us back. Mm-hmm. Are there an and I see sexual energy and life force energy as really the same. Like, you know, when we're like four and you have the impulse to take food off someone else's plate. Like, and you get told not to do that until as adults, we don't have to have the impulse anymore often, mm. but through working with psychedelics and some other sexual de-armoring practices that I've done, I have that impulse. I got that impulse back. 
And when I got it back, I was shocked. I was sitting at a restaurant and I had this body impulse to grab my dining partner's burger. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, it's back right? Mm -hmm. This is, this is what's possible for the human being. And as an adult, I can choose not to act on mm -hmm. that. Probably best in most that I don't, but it's really interesting what we're able to free up and get back. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that to me is sexual energy. That's life force energy. That's just like desire to live. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's really an interesting point. I never considered it like that, like with the, the impulse to grab food, which is such a base desire, is like hunger. And yeah, just because it's on someone else's plate, if they ordered something better than you, of course, there's going to be this kind of urge. And there's, and of course, yeah, you don't want to be that dinner partner that just deals people's food. So we're socialized to not do that. But then it actually completely extinguishes the desire and the impulse. And yeah. so much of our desires have experienced, like have gone through that process where people don't know what they desire. That's right. That's right. They don't know. And so then how can you have joy? Exactly. Well, and it's interesting. So I, I was doing a little bit of a series on loneliness on Instagram where I just uh, kind of like, right. I didn't really think about what I would post or what I would do is sort of like, I wanted to just kind of pull up quotes that were interesting to me. And I was listening to lectures by James Hillman, the, the, psycho, the psychotherapist, psychoanalyst. And he's talking about the, so he has a lecture called Fathering the Boy Inside. It's basically like the inner child, but I, I guess he gave this lecture in like, I don't know, the seventies, I don't even know. And um, so he's talking about how, you know, accessing our needs and our neediness helps us access the inner child because that's what needs typically. Um, that wasn't that, that's what wasn't afraid to ask for needs before those needs were were denied them and that helps access the imagination and so through the imagination ver versus like trying to get things from the external world to meet the needs it's like noticing what the imagination wants and how that's sort of meeting your needs right he's like it's not just that you want company if you're lonely it's probably very specific you want the person to say something you want to be somewhere there are images that come up and he's like, through that, that Im image process, image imagination process, there you start to, the needs start to turn to wants. And the wants, whereas a need is sort of the, represents this emptiness, a want and desire is, it fills us, like you're full of desire. And that changes the energy. It starts to become hot. It starts to become very motivating, very directive. Things start to happen. And so it's like this process of need to desire and want starts to take place when you sit with it versus trying to just meet it externally. And then, yes. Cool. And that requires, I love this because that requires a kind of tolerating of the wanting, which in the child who hasn't received the needs, um, they haven't learned to tolerate the wanting in the nervous system. Right. And so we jump to give me, give me, give me in all the thousand ways that we do and our phones don't help mm -hmm. without experiencing that full desire. Like you said, I love that. Mm -hmm. And we're full when we have desire. We're not empty. Right. And we're, and we're scared. And then he's also, you know, desires or leads you to your purpose because it's this burning hot thing that moves you in a direction he's like the extinguishing of it is like a fear of it. Like I, maybe I'm not competent enough to do this thing that I know I need to do. Maybe I I'll fail or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll extinguish it we stay in the need and then we shame our needs. Oh, I'm so needy. Oh, it makes me feel uncomfortable or gross. And so we shut it down or, you know, I, I need comfort. And so then I eat chocolate cake versus eating chocolate cake out of a burning desire to have it. You know, it's very different. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's so interesting. Yeah. So this impulse too, it starts with like an, a physical animal impulse. If I want to grab a burger off this person's yeah. plate. Mm -hmm. And that could, you know, also be related to sexual energy to, mm -hmm. yeah, to feel, to feel it, to let ourselves feel it, mm -hmm. which is completely different from acting on it. Mm -hmm. 
to, to feel it in the surprising range of scenarios we might feel it to be curious about what turns us on rather than have an idea of what should or should not right. is a fascinating exploration it's so interesting right because yeah. if it starts with like a neediness of like um i don't know this kind of lacking emptiness related to sexuality and then the action to fill the emptiness versus mm -hmm. like the journey of noticing you know the want and desire which and, and even the imagination like because it may be very specific and you may learn a lot about your sexuality through that process i think it's the neediness i think it's also the conditioning if we start with i don't know i need this kind of man to be the partner of my children so i will only be interested like that's like a sliver of what's possible. And we put this whole societal piece on our life force energy before we even started, mm -hmm. as opposed to what, and when I'm in a room, like what actually feels interesting, mm -hmm. very different things. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, we were also talking before recording about um, our sexual like attraction to certain people may also lead us in the direction of healing certain wounds. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so when you're sort of looking for the compatible partner, that may not be the person. And, you know, usually in dating advice too, they'll say things like, you know, oh, well, the healthy relationship for you is may not, may feel like there's no chemistry. And you're often told that. And I used to kind of reject that because I'm like, well, if I don't feel like there's chemistry, I don't want to date this person. So why would I force it? You know, it just didn't really make sense to me. To, to kind of pursue something where there wasn't a kind of a, an attraction or a chemistry or a chemical thing, even if maybe someone is telling me to try because it might be healthier. Um, I don't know. Yeah. What do you, what, what do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, that one, it's a big art. Like, I think we are attracted to what is not in us and what is in us and that generally we find our match. And as a therapist, it's kind of amazing. Like the phrase, there's someone for everyone. Like it's kind of amazing because people find each other and then they engage in whatever they engage in. And it's like, wow, you two are really perfect, right? Um, I, I tend to believe that we do, to, if we're talking about a partner, like a, a relationship of some kind, we're usually wanting someone who treats us better than people have in the past. We're usually wanting to up level, which means we have to up level ourselves, mm -hmm. which is usually hard to do. Like it sounds all great to have self-worth, but usually <laughs> it's really hard and we resist it. Mm -hmm. And I know certainly like certain modalities or teachers that I now am very open to. I used to, think that they were too positive. <laughs> so, you know, like, so I think we do have to tolerate a bit with someone we're looking for, because if it's too, it's hard to describe it energetically, if it's too down, if it's too magnetic in a kind of way that we know and are familiar with, it's probably not the right call. And this is where like getting to know ourselves is really key. But if it's, if it does require a bit of tolerating and we can be open and see if there's chemistry, that's amazing. But we can't force anything. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like that we also can't do. Because this is the other piece. We're actually in relationship to grow. Right. That's what the magnetism is. That's what the attraction is. So it's not possible. Like it's just, that's the way it's going to be. You're going to be attracted to someone and then you're going to be like, oh my God, I hate that thing about them. That is just fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's only how we deal with that and how our partner deals with that. Mm -hmm. It's the how. It's not, are we going to run into each other's shit? Of course we mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to be triggered, but maybe oh. not fetishize the trigger and make it go on for 10 years if it's the same story. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And maybe have a partner who can also work on their triggers and then maybe we can both take responsibility and have a more generative mm -hmm. energy between us. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. This is, yeah, this is very, 
yeah and it all seems to come from like a very yeah like you said like a very kind of deeper sort of energy it's not just it's not this sort of healing isn't necessarily coming from our conditioning of like this is the person I supposed to date and he's supposed to have this bank account or whatever it is you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, letting that impulse to grab the burger <laughs> take take some some part of the process. Yeah, and I gotta say, like, I think we need to give ourselves that. Mm. Like, we spend a lot of time holding back, and I think there has to be a period of giving ourselves the burger mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and getting to know ourselves in that way. Yeah, I mean, we are. Yeah, we're we're socialized you know and some of some of us overly socialized where we're completely yeah um mm -hmm. yeah you know kind of the all the edges are sort of shaved off so that we can fit neatly into <laughs> society it's true. But, yeah uh, and there comes a point i can only speak for being a woman because that's what i am it comes a point in a woman's life when that's not so fun anymore mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a little empty and being who I thought I should be is just lost its juice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm thinking of the person who has maybe had some sort of breakdown in their life, knows maybe that they've had a difficult past, but mm -hmm. isn't sure even there's a lot of narratives on how one might work with trauma, right? It's like, oh, talking to someone about it or going and get help or psychedelic medicines or whatever, getting into meditation. And, you know, I'm just, what I'm sort of feeling into right now is the experience of somebody who sort of knows there's something there and mm -hmm. is, just has no idea how to start like yeah. working with that energy or, or letting that out or whatever needs to happen, you know? Um, but someone who's perhaps like muted a lot of their energy has, um, you know, and, and those, those emotions are coming out in the form of anxiety, maybe or rage or depression or feeling numb. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and they're sort of like, okay, I know that, that maybe it's time for me to heal, but I don't really know what that would look like. Like, <laughs> Mm -hmm. people coming in at that at that stage um who are kind of like okay like i feel like things aren't working but i don't know how to begin <laughs> yeah and and what I, I would say two things one is trust yourself if that's what you think you are correct and then trust yourself as to what you're drawn to if you're drawn to Talia, email Talia. If you're drawn to Allison, email Allison. Like good people, you know, if, if I can't help someone, I'll pass them on to somebody else. Just take the step and see what somebody might say. Find someone who's walked the path and, and like really trust yourself. This is like, you wouldn't recognize me 10 years ago. You would not recognize me. There is so much healing possible. The amount of trauma I have is outrageous. And now I'm so grounded and happy, I can't even. Mm -hmm. Not that there aren't challenges, but there is so much, so much, so much possible. And there's so many passionate people like ourselves doing the work every day, learning, figuring it out. Like, how does this work? How do we heal? So just like reach out. And the other thing I would say, and this is something I'm really figuring out how to write about or how to speak about, it's money mindset. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, I, I have spent so much money. Like, I don't even want to say how much money I've spent on my own self. To, you know, I'm, am I as fan financially secure as I could be? Absolutely not. But I have myself. And our culture has sold us lies about what we should have and what we shouldn't have and how we should look and how we shouldn't. And if we honestly look at how we're spending our money and the value we're getting for it, many, many people could invest a lot more in themselves and they could heal. And so if money comes up as something, I just, I just feel like I have to say, like, this is something to explore. There's a lot of good work to be done here because I see people 
ready to do the work, who have the resources, walking away because of money, and it breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. it breaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we you know we talk about that with um, with Adele in another episode because it's sort of this connection of like money, relationship, health is this ball of yarn where you yeah. can pick the money because the money is this really tangible thing. You know how much is in your bank account. You know how much stuff costs. Uh -huh. Health is intangible. Relationships are intangible. So a lot of that comes out in money where the lack, the lack of self-worth, the lack of like the sense of abundance, the lack of trust in, in the universe or society or whatever, um, the lack of trust in resources. And that often comes out very obviously when it comes to money. If you just ask somebody like to tell you about their thoughts on money, you can get a lot of information about their thoughts on. Totally. Yeah. And other, you know, I, I feel really strongly about this because um, class and economic differences are so big in our society. Mm. And I think for those of us who are educated, who have professions, who have assets and income, for us to claim poverty mm. is a really big problem. It subverts social justice mm. and it subverts the supporting of a society that is actually equitable. Mm. So I'm always really careful to say, yes, there are real economic challenges, but let's not pretend that when we're having two vacations a year and multiple estheticians and all this stuff, which is great, but let's not pretend that that's poverty. It's a good point. You know, it is. And it, it's really, you know, I'm sure, I mean, when I was a early practitioner, I worked a lot more with sliding scale. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, one patient who had accepted like a very low rate <laughs> and I was just a brand new practitioner kind of like, oh, you know, and parking is so expensive and I had to get my car maintained. And I was like, oh yeah, that's hard for her. Then I, I ended my shift for the day and I'm waiting for the bus. And I was like, hey, hang on a second. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, I want to help people out and make my work more accessible, but you know, if my patient's taking the car and I'm taking the bus, I think they should pay full price. <laughs> like, you know, it was just like a small little thing in terms of this idea of like our money story and whether that's, yes actual reality and what it means to to need money but th but that's related to so many things like health is like that like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's you know it's it's that when it when it's money and it's like a tangible number you can sort of compare you you get this really secure base of reality where it's like this is actually what the number is here's all your thoughts about it um, right. you know yeah yeah and yeah. it's a good point because I think sometimes that can be where fear shows up, where it's like, well, I can't yeah. afford it. Yeah. Exactly. That's where we cut ourselves up. And I see that so often, mm -hmm. so often. So I have a little bit of passion about how that could be voiced in a way that's so compassionate and empowering. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you said too, like, I think what was, what were things like 10 years ago? I mean, maybe you don't need to go into super dense detail, but whatever you want to share, but I'm just curious because I think like I've had conversations with people who have, you know, recognize that their current state isn't optimal for them. They're connecting it to their past because they know that they've experienced significant trauma, had a, a tough childhood, tough, really tough things happened in their past. And they know there's a connection, but they're like, I, but it's, there's a lot of like, this is sort of the way I am. Like I've been messed up, let's say, or I've, you know, I'm kind of this like damaged person. There's this sort of narrative. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying things like, well, this is not, this is something you can heal from if you want. It's not easy, but maybe you could speak to that experience. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I consider one of my greatest gifts to be some kind of faith, some little flicker of a candle that said, keep going because I see that that's not easy. Mm. Um, I, 10 years ago, I was on Wall Street. I was a stock trader. I was traveling all over the world, quoted in all the papers, like really good job, good. Mm -hmm. um, but I was not happy. I was stressed out of my mind and my relationships were really empty. I'd been through a breakup that had been really horrible financially. Um, a lot was being taken from work and the relationship side. It just all felt 
blech, icky. And I ate like crap, drank too much. Everything anybody said went straight in. Completely thin skin. Didn't believe I was any good at anything despite my managing director title. Mm. And there was no fun. Mm. And so, you know, I wouldn't have been a person you'd invite onto your podcast. That's for sure. Mm. I would say inside my biggest change is that I can be present now. I used to always be somewhere else. I was not here. I was not in my body. Mm-hmm. And, and that's really sad. Mm-hmm. Like that, and that, it does not have to be that way. It absolutely does not. And it's actually not that hard. I mean, it's been a long decade and I've done a lot of things, but the world is changing and there's so many opportunities to heal. There's so many amazing people doing work that can help. And you can actually be present and happy. That is possible. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's a really, it's a beautiful way to just distill it down to like, when I'm present, you see all these, these external things change, even the way I am. <laughs> like, cause I can't imagine you as a Wall Street trader. <laughs> really. People but, say that, I'm like, thank you so much. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad you said that. Like, I can't. Yeah, because I imagine like your energy must have been so different. Mm-hmm. and and it's like but it's not about working with those signals it's about being more present and yeah. and that's you know I mean with, with with the kind of person I'm thinking of um who has that trauma that is a big thing it's like they're so like it's they're not present you know they're they're always somewhere else and needing to distract and feeling like relationships aren't as satisfying and work is not that sad. Work feels like a burden. Like you were saying, like it just feels like things are being taken. A lot of fatigue, a lot of pain in the body, um, a lot of lack of awareness of how things are connected, like eating something and not feeling great. Like all these things I see, it, it, a lot of it comes down to lack of presence. I remember like I would spend all weekend watching binge watching a TV show, like all weekend. Mm -hmm. And I I just thought, oh, I'm tired from the week. Yeah, I need some me time. I need to fill myself. But you're like, I'm not filling myself. No. Mm -hmm. No, and like, oh God. I mean, I have more energy now at 45 than I had at 25. Mm -hmm. Like times 10. (laughs) That's amazing, yeah. (laughs) It's true, like having more presence does make you like, I have tons of energy. When I need to rest, I rest. So it's not, there isn't this chronic energy deficit that we're running. You're like, oh, I all of a sudden have a 10 hour sleep because I needed it. Now I'm back, racing That's around right. with dogs. Mm-hmm. And when, when something happens that makes me angry or sad, I cry. Mm-hmm. I probably cry, cry twice a day for like 10 seconds. And then I've forgotten that I even cried, except sometimes I get my makeup and then I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> you know? But it's just like, it's a, it's a moving cycle of being a human being. And when we're so attached, past and future, it's exhausting. But when we're just running the show, it's no problem. <laughs> well, yeah, because it's lot, yeah, it's like, you know, even if you think of like the burdens of life, like the responsibilities we have, because no one's free of responsibilities, like taking care of, a pet or a child or relationships or anything like that or work. It's, it's like more of the thoughts and the anticipation and the stories and all that that's exhausting. It's not so much <laughs> like, like loading a dishwasher, unloading a dishwasher, playing with your kids, going for a walk. Like none of that's really a burden when you're in it. It's the thoughts about it, the how is it going to happen? What, what am I going to do? Like even I was having a conversation with a, uh, a colleague who's another naturopath and we were saying, you know, what makes our work hard is the, the extra burden and responsibility we, we put on ourselves that maybe shouldn't necessarily be. Yeah. And it's not just doing the work. Totally. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I can tell now when I'm a little tired because I start to think about, oh no, I got so much to clean, so much to do. And then I'm like, oh, I'm just tired. (laughs) (laughs) And then you rest and then it's like, oh yeah, this isn't so bad, it's not that hard. But I think when you're chronically tired, you just think it's normal. And when all the people around you are chronically tired, chronically stressed out, everybody's like, oh, it's normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like even your description of life 10 years ago, 
It's like a lot of people may listen and be like, well, that's just what it's like to be an adult. You have a job you don't love, but it pays the bills. You right. have to veg out to make up for it. You have no time to eat well like that's just what life is what what's the alternative like, like yeah like what you is know, life like my, my the phrase that always gets me is it is what it is right like oh, yeah. it is what it is i've heard that so no, no 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 <laughs> like we are universal conscious energy that's what we are we we just look like we're different we're all part of this thing and we're divine. And I don't mean that in a bypassing woo woo kind of way, although I swore I would never say woo woo again. So, um, it's like we're divine. We are divine. There's no way that there is what it is. That is taking a back seat. There is exactly how you want it to be. I don't mean the external circumstances. Again, I hate this when people say that you create your own reality and blah, 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 because there are tragedies and challenges in life that are real and that we are asked to address, but we do get the choice of how. Mm -hmm. So there's no, there is, it is what it is. There's always a choice in how we show up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is what it is, is this, yeah, versus, I'm just <laughs> like, you know, this, this idea of longing for, like, <laughs> this is another Hillman thing where he's like, you know, all neediness or all longing is, it's like, you know, you just, you don't just want a new pair of jeans. Like you want to unite with being. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like feel into that. He's like, of course you have deep, deep neediness. Cause you have like, the needs are great. The needs are, are big. Like you, you know, you have big wants. You want to be big. Connected to the great beyond. <laughs> yeah. And children know this. Like children say the most amazing things. And then as we get older, we're, we're taught, oh, you know, you don't want to think about making a little bit more money because that's not possible. Like our dreams get so squashed, but we have them. Mm -hmm. We definitely have them. I think it's great when they come up. Gets me very excited. And when you have, yeah. And that's the thing. Yeah. It's, I mean, children are very present, you know, present and connected to an animal mm -hmm. self. And, you know, a lot of parents and adults feel like it's our job to socialize them and manage their inevitable disappointments, you know, manage their expectations. Like, so that, yeah, it, it is what it is. Like I was yeah. taught that from when I was four, you know, can't have what I want. It's not realistic. I can't take someone's burger. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, it's wrong to even. <laughs> food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's that comes out, and that comes out around sexuality. That comes out around money. Um, definitely, many religious traditions teach it's wrong to even covet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is this is this is problematic. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Would it? Yeah. How do psychedelics start to reintegrate that? Because. Like, how have you found that they start to lead us more into presence? I mean, being on a psychedelic journey is a lot of like, you're not really, you know, watching TV and trying to disconnect. Like, it's kind of in your face, but the moment <laughs> and whatever needs to come up. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I think though people can still block a psychedelic experience if they really try. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. How, how does that... I think that the, the psychedelic really... Um, they're healing trauma. That's their ultimate mm -hmm. way of operating. So they're stitching us back together, whether that's through letting us feel something or come back into our body or connect to spirit, but they're putting it all back together again. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, presence is a result of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. We don't have this sort of you know, hunk of brain tissue that's dedicated to like keeping something separate from ourselves or yes. like trying to process this thing like that gets integrated and then we can see. Hmm. Yeah, because that's always out of fear that we're trying to control something we can't control, worry about something that doesn't need to be worried about, their energy loss. And so it must be out of fear because why would like, my cat wouldn't do something that exhausts him. 
you got to be kidding me. He's tired. He rests. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what's, what's that experience of like, you know, the trauma coming up in a psychedelic experience? Like what are most people, because I think that can be very scary when someone feels like they're just jumping into an abyss if they're you know, doing an ayahuasca ceremony or a psilocybin ceremony. Like how does the trauma usually, and we also, we talk about this idea of like re-traumatization, especially in like a more of a talk therapy context um, where somebody is sort of- yeah launched into their story maybe and it, it all comes flooding back and that's a big fear like a lot of people are like I don't want to um, see my childhood or re-experience these things like I, I'd rather they not be with me on the day-to-day um, and so there can be a real fear about like taking a medicine that may start to bring those things up but like how do they typically come up in those yeah I mean This is where, to me, intention is key. I have rarely had childhood experiences come up. The healing that I've experienced on psychedelics and that I see with lots of people is actually not that bad. I mean, they the way I think of it is they're working over. They're combing through the body, the energetic, the spirits. They're working you. And you don't have to relive something. Mm -hmm. That being said, you have to allow yourself emotional access. So you may cry and not know why you're crying and you have to let that energy move. Mm -hmm. And I think when we choose to enter in a medicine journey, we, we set our intention and then the more we can say thank you for the medicine and lean into what the medicine is offering as opposed to push it away, the deeper the healing. Mm -hmm. So you always have free will. You can say, please ease up. You know, this is too much for me. And they will ease up. I mean, you are you are in charge here. You're not just gonna be sent down a spiral hole, which is a re-traumatization. But you also have to engage. And the more you are willing to engage and take risks and have that snotty cry that you don't want to have, the more it's all gonna move. Right. That's my experience. No, you can ask to take a peek and then you can see what else is there. Like you can kind of move in that direction. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it is just like emotional release. And, and- you chose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You brought yourself here and you can trust yourself. Yeah. And that self trust is big, right? Like even just having that experience of I trusted myself and it was okay could be huge for somebody yes Mm -hmm. it's huge and it builds on itself and it's a beautiful thing to have Mm -hmm. like I know now in my body whether I should do something or not do it and sometimes it's weird like I do some weird stuff and I'll be like really my mind will say you've got to be kidding me you're not going to do that and my body's like you bet we are Mm -hmm. and it's always good yeah so I think this this is wisdom that grow that's such a joy to not always be evaluating in our heads Mm, it's true I mean I mean I had an experience maybe 10 years ago where I was deciding if I wanted to stay in a relationship or end it and I was like I just don't know the difference between like something's wrong for me and I don't want to do it or fear and the therapist was like well where does it is there no difference and then immediately I was like oh yeah there's a big difference okay (laughs) like fears here discussed or like no is here and okay yeah it's <laughs> it was really quick but and even like you know cr- uh, creating that connection and being aware of like oh the no is really present even though my head is giving me all kinds of good reasons to go ahead with this project right so, mm-hmm. yeah yeah no. totally and then you're like and then there's this idea and you're like really this is what we're (laughs) this is what I'm gonna do now okay (laughs) and then life becomes so fun Mm. because I don't have to have a good reason and tell you all the evidence and this and that like I trust myself and I trust my body and I can negotiate new experiences so then I just get to leap into new things whenever I want to Mm. without fear and this is, this is amazing. Yeah. 
fear this is or great. this is like living like a child. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the cat just yeah, it's just I know, and we all we're all jealous of our pets, right? It's like, oh, if I could only be like my dog, he just chills all day, you know, but there's <laughs> yeah, I mean he's 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 earned that by being present. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. knows, yeah like he knows what he wants I mean um it's in, and also like what you're speaking to I'm hearing is this this there isn't a fear around like what people will think right that's sort of not maybe that is there but it doesn't seem like it's a big decision making or at least you're you're aware with of that thought and like okay well that's just not a factor in the decision making process anymore whereas I think it yes. drives so many of us wanting to be liked Oh my God. Wanting to be approved of, um, you know, how things look, looking good. Yeah, and this, this is so important because we, this is trauma too. The idea that we wouldn't be liked if we didn't do what somebody else wanted. Well, what kind of person makes their approval conditional? Mm -hmm. Not somebody important to us, really. Mm. Um, but, but when things don't go right early, we, we, we do this math that, that isn't correct. And as the psychedelics are a big piece of this, the breath work, the work with sexual energy, emotional release, as we increase our energy and feel full of desire, like you so beautifully said, then we're not so worried anymore. Mm. Like sometimes it comes to me, I'm like, I must look a bit kooky and then I'm like, mm, whatever. <laughs> because my energy is big enough but it took years it took years to get it this big such that it's kind of like it just bounces off now those thoughts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then if someone is like disapproving what's that experience like now because for a lot of people it's like like you said like thin skin like I feel that a lot where and I know most of my friends and people who have even done lots of work are like really upset if they get negative feedback. There's like this whole self-evaluation that takes place when you hear something negative. You know, it's not just like, oh, I maybe could have improved on this thing. It's like, oh, I'm a bad person. Sometimes it all collapses down to like our worth on this planet. And what's the experience now? If somebody's like, this is all pretty weird. Or if you get some negative feedback, like as we all do, like what, what does that show up as now? I'm just curious. <laughs> so sometimes it's a lesson and it's really hard. Like I'll get three at once that hit a particular nerve and I got to go heal that nerve. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it is very challenging, but very often it's short. Like I'll feel like Ugh, shame and then I let it move. And 10 seconds later, I've literally forgotten. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's about the physical healing. That's not about anything I tell myself. Like, that's not about affirmations. That's not about mindset. It's, it's the strength of the physical energy running through me that, that keeps it moving so it doesn't get stuck. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, so it's like you can literally just feel the emotion kind of ebb and flow, like crescendo and then decrescendo yeah. and then it's gone you're like okay yeah i didn't have to stew with it or let it ruminate or fester it just literally came in and out yeah yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. so it's like it's not that shame mm -hmm. never shows up that's a really important thing i think like shame definitely comes in but it yeah. it ebbs and flows yeah. and it's i don't live in shame yeah. mm -hmm. and once you get to know that it does then when it does show up even when it shows up a little more seriously and a trigger I know it's going to move. Like, I know I'm going to feel better in an hour. Yeah. So it's just like, okay, I'll feel better in an hour. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's this looseness, right? Rather than examining everything I ever did. And da, 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 da. Right. Yeah. Who am I now? Oh my gosh. Like, da, da, da. like all the oh. things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Reevaluating. Mm -hmm. like, do I, am I even cut out for this? Am I, but all that stuff, right? Like, we yeah. like, it's a, essentially, I think, see, it's like a collapsing. Uh, various layers of identity into what that that wasn't like no one criticized your right on this planet they just sit on like whatever the thing was you know and uh and yeah, it, they had their own thoughts. yes exactly and yet we can like really let that like 
do damage, you know? Um, but yeah, but that's, yeah. And, and it's, it's great because we come at it from, yeah, like the affirmations, the mindset, like we try and go like top down, but you're explaining like it's very physical and animalistic. It's like just, yeah, like staying with the body. Absolutely. Yeah. And I really believe in the mindset work after mm. the physical work. I think the chakras are a great model. You start with the root, then you get some pleasure, then you get some self-esteem and some love, and then you can speak. And then, you know, the mindset can just expand, expand, expand. But I think we all know people who have a six, seven, super open, who like are not grounded and have so much pain that they can't feel. And this is really an important piece. Mm -hmm. That's actually a great point. Yeah. Every single psychotherapist I've been to and works with chakras is like, yeah, you're really into all this kind of airy stuff. You got to work on your root chakra, like <laughs> get your house in order, like purge all the things that you don't want in your life and, <laughs> and whatever, like ground, do ground. I used to, think the root chakra was boring totally yeah you're like ew who wants material stuff yeah <laughs> but and like to be present there's nothing more boring <laughs> right yeah unbelievable yeah who am i without my my ruminations <laughs> like i am no, my... and my ideas Right. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. You're like I'm just my default mode network ro walking around and yeah. I, in one of what my sign are you, Italian? Pisces. Yeah. Huh? What are you? What, what's yours, Allison? Gemini. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so much of my family is Gemini. They're all Gemini. I think I have, oh, wow. I have some Gemini in my chart, I think, but it's a Pisces with a lot of Aquarius. Aquarius rising and Aquarius cusp. So there's a lot of air-ish Pisces. Yeah. <laughs> and all of my best friends are Aquarians. That. Yeah. Like every, all of them. They're all like very Aquarian. Yeah. Yeah. Air type. Yeah. But yeah, there, when there's, yeah, a lot of air in one's chart versus like the Taurus who's knows who they are, what they want. Da, da, da. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's true i yeah that's true the the root chakra being boring i remember being like ah, really that's my what i need to work on like getting some dark stones and focusing on like shavasana and you know, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's like, yeah that's lame but definitely <laughs> You know, but despite the resistance, I think, you know, like you, there's definitely more of an awareness. Not, it could be more for sure. <laughs> That's what we all could be. But there's definitely more of an awareness of the body. And one thing that's been, that's helped me is like the differentiation, like knowing my emotions. And sometimes they can be overwhelming, but being able to work with them a little bit more than being completely overwhelmed by them, being able to articulate them, being able to own them you know, not put them on someone else, not move right into reaction. Like that's been really helpful for me. And then this bodied awareness, embodied awareness of what the body needs has been helpful. And that's probably from my work as an ND in, in trying to, in focusing a lot on the body um, and what it needs and what's true in terms of what we need to eat and move and all that stuff, you know, um, like doing sort of self education. Right. Yeah. Um, which is also interesting because sure. when you're saying like for the person who's looking to begin some sort of journey to healing, like maybe that person's drawn to supplements, you know, as the, like nutrition as the first step. And this idea of like all roads lead to the root of whatever it is. Yes. And that journey could start with like weight loss or like wanting to get fit or like as long as we allow that process to take oh. over. Mm-hmm. A thousand percent. And I suggest to many of my clients when I was a therapist, I almost always actually want them to see a naturopathic doctor alongside the psychotherapy um, because I believe they go so perfectly hand in hand. And I also completely agree with you. We each follow where whatever gets us there. 
whatever attracts us or whatever pain or symptom we have, it's going to get us where we need to go. So we just fall. Yeah. So just, yeah. If it's migraines, it started the process. Like I talked about this with one of my guests, Yusuf, he was like, he focuses on sexual health as well. And he's like, yeah, he's like, you focus on mood. He's like, I focus on sexual health. We all do this. Thing. We do. We essentially have the same practice. We just put a different shape. <laughs> <channel. laughs> like we're, totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And uh, if this is more like somebody who's Googling mood, they might find me and they Google like men's health, mm-hmm. sexual health, they Google him and they Google like, you know, deeper like integration, like long-term sort of coaching and transformation, they find you. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, you know, honestly, I really struggle with how we're asked to market and talk about ourselves because of just that. Mm. Um, yeah. That's another conversation, but, but there is kind of this requirement to narrow and talk about outcomes when really we're talking about cosmic energy. I don't have a clue what outcome you should have, but I'm here for you, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're also not used to that idea, right? Like everything is very outcome driven. So you're like, well, I have this thing. Like my grandmother said, she's like, I got a call from my doctor and I got really scared. And she said that. And, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I might be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. We get a call from our doctor. We're scared. But now knowing more about medicine, I'm like, what would your doctor know? There isn't necessarily a routine blood work that's going to show something scary. Like you come in to your doctor saying you don't feel well. Then they start doing investigations but there's never, you're never necessarily like surprised, but like your doctor just calls you because they have this intuitive sense that you might have cancer or something. It's not, it doesn't usually work that way, but there's this idea of like the doctor has this insight and will tell me. And, but that is usually happening in a very quick, brief moment. Um, and it's, and it's, and then I'll be patched up and on my way. And I'm like, it's not really how I see it working. <laughs> but how do you convey that to someone who's been trained to accept that model? I know. You know? Yeah. Like, even my other grandmother, she's like, when I go to this the This is doc- probably... <laughs> go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, she goes, no, to the no. doc- <laughs> she goes to the doctor and she's like, he asked me what's wrong with me. And I go, you tell me, you're the doctor. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, yeah, it's like this... this you can like sense your energy. I'm like, yeah. no, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. This is a big reason why I walked away from my license, to be honest, because the setup is come fix me. Yeah. And in that therapist client relationship, I struggled. And my whole desire is to give, to help people access the power themselves. That is like what I'm great at. And the setup of the client patient undermined that right from the start. And the way I was supposed to create treatment plans and all this, like, I, like that's great and mental health care is really, really, really important. But for me, that's an insult to another human being the way I work. I don't have a treatment plan, but I will tell, you know, I can, I can, help you in the reconnection process and it will be amazing Mm. which is a different orientation entirely it's like yeah responding in the moment like i'm not here with a plan i'm implementing i definitely work through plan but the best sessions happen like session three four five where we now have relationship we're working with some sort of framework but there's more of a responsiveness to Someone brings something in and you feel into it and then something interesting comes up and that's where the attention and the work needs to go. And it's very scary to do that because you don't know what's going to happen. You can't prepare for it. You, you, know, <laughs> you are preparing for it all the time, but there isn't this sense of like, you know, I'm looking up studies to support, you know, it's more bringing yourself to that um, and your attention. Um, yeah so yeah this idea of like you know and then you know a lot of people coming in like okay i have this thing wrong like i can't get out of bed in the morning i'm so tired i'm so sad i need to be fixed so i can get back to work and we have that model too it's very industrial right it's like we need to be 
fixing people and patching people, even workplace wellness programs. Like we're going to have you do yoga at lunch. So you can be more productive in the afternoon. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you're like, well, this is not how I work. Like if you're coming in with, with this issue, like you can't get out of bed and you can't, you, you feel like you can't operate in your life. Maybe that's the signal that an entire transformation is coming. And I want to be there for that. Um, versus like just kind of totally you know wrapping your leg up and sending you back out to war <laughs> exactly like i actually think that anxiety is generally a sign from the soul that the true and false self are misaligned mm -hmm. and so to just try and get rid of the symptom is really reductive and repressive in that case because really what we want, we want to know what the anxiety's got to say. Right. What I, what I find a lot with anxiety is that the traditional therapies, so either the medications for it or even the natural therapies for it, the sedatives, like, so, you know, think of like sedation, like numbing the senses, numbing the nervous system. And then, but it often, in, in most, almost every case, the person's like, I now feel depressed now that you've sedated me. Like you've taken away the anxiety and now I'm in this hole like I'm yes. and it's like right because that's not what you need it's not sedation that's required it's yeah mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and what happens so there's this deep sense of you know things are not integrated I actually do see that where you know people with with quite a bit of awareness will say yeah I feel like I'm just what you know yeah my needs there's a big gap between my needs and what my reality is and uh and there's this sense of powerlessness and how to bridge those two things um and so they're like they're waking up with this sense of dread in the pit of the stomach you know no appetite nausea like jittery uh complete overwhelm um you know complete lack of motivation to do things like everything is just a big burden and oh man so many people live that way and so many so many yeah yep you're like yeah and it's hard yeah and so then then they start get started on the journey and then they start to discover <laughs> you know presence or yeah yeah like what yeah. are some of the, so can you speak about the, the program that you're, that you're running? Like you work very closely with a small number of people over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, how, what's the model like now that you're working under or that you've you created? So I have both group and one-on-one -on -one offerings, but the model's similar. The one-on-one -on -one is just a bit more custom. And what happens is I do a big intake and I get a sense of the energy and I evaluate physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, sexually. And I get a sense of like what can be done here and what is the person wanting and what, what can we start to put together? What will, what will work? And usually it starts with, so then I have a team. So I'm, I'm like the strategist. And then I might prescribe, you know, eight sessions of breath work, transformational breath work. And that really gets the feelings moving. Like if somebody's got tears inside, it's going to get it going and they're going to start connecting to who they are and they're going to start to see shifts quickly. I also work with a herbalist who's very profound um, in how he helps people connect to um, their energy, their spirituality with herbs, also for grounding and nourishment. Um, core energetics is another piece that I bring in a lot, which is like an emotionally based psychotherapy um, that gets at feelings in the body. So she'll have you expressing emotions that way. And we kind of I give, it, it's probably similar to how you work. I give a prescription, then I check in every few weeks. My clients have WhatsApp or Voxer access to me, and I just get a sense for how's the energy going. And then a challenge will come up, and we'll see how they deal with it. And I'll be like, okay, so let's add this piece in. Like, let's do some shamanic clearing, or let's um, do some coaching on sexuality and pleasure, or let's do a mushroom ceremony and, and really go deep. Usually, I'd say four weeks into a one-on-one -on -one engagement, I'll do some type of psychedelic work 
to really plunge, but I like to get the energy moving first. So that's kind of how it works. I tend to work in six month engagements and it's, it's very custom, very organic. I'm listening to the soul. I'm listening to the day-to-day -day needs. We're trying to, we go full Cosmo and then we go like, okay, so it's mom's birthday. Like, how are we going to handle this? So we're, we're really bridging all the levels and it just layers, 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 another layer. And at the end of six months, unrecognizable, really. It's really amazing. Really, it sounds like it. Like, yeah, imagine, I mean, so many therapy sessions, you're talking about mom's birthday and <laughs> all those like practical pieces. And then you're sort of like trying to pull in like this kind of doing like some trauma stuff on the side and okay remember you know this cognitive thing you have and let's connect that to mom's birthday but you're like we've yeah, yeah. journeyed together <laughs> and uh yeah. how are we going to apply that to this practice yeah. situation that's going to be difficult exactly yeah exactly and we're working with a really strong intention everybody does their engagements with me with an intention and i'm constantly tethering us back so we're not processing for the sake of processing. We know exactly where we're going. And that, of course, can evolve. But the strength of intention is a container for the energy. This isn't just like for fun. We, you know, we're, we're trying to help somebody find their voice, build intimacy, increase energy, shine in the world, connect to purpose. These are just very important big intentions and, and they, they propel the work, which is really beautiful. It's, yeah, it's like we have one life, you know, we're on this planet for a short time yeah. and to be caged in like, you know, yes. Wall Street position that seems like you shouldn't question it because it, every, it's kind of validated and you know, like there could be so much more. You could really be alive. So much. Yeah. So much. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Yeah. It's so deep, right? Because I mean, there's so many ways that somebody could move in the direction of healing. And I think sometimes as practitioners, we feel like, like many times I, I look at a case with someone I'm working with and I'm like, I just, I feel overwhelmed by how much there is to do with this person and how much, I mean, this is all coming from my place too, like how much they need to know or how much needs to change for them to feel better but you know i mean it's yeah it can really yeah like i mean you can start doing that work from any place and and it can be really deep mm. and and it can look like someone has a long way to go and all of our healing journeys are long but the biggest hurdle is the yes to yourself and once you say, yes, I'm in, and I'm going to put the time, the energy, the money into myself, you're going to, you're going to get there and probably surprisingly quickly, because there's a lot of really powerful modalities out there these days. We are rich in healing. Mm. So there's so much that's possible. It's so great. It's so yeah, I love that. I love that as a place to end off too of like this is the first like if all of this sounds overwhelming and big and like what six months to total transformation where I may not have the same job relationship self identity. It's like, well, just start by saying yes to yourself and see what happens. Yeah. Whether it's like going to get a massage yeah. this week or something. Totally. Totally. Allison, so where can any last thoughts? <laughs> I mean, it's a good last thought. I just have really so enjoyed and appreciated this conversation, Talia. Um, yeah, I think I've said the things I want to say. People can find me at my website, AllisonCrossway.com, um, or Facebook, Instagram, wherever you like. Perfect. We'll put all those links up so people can can follow you and right. check out your website and see what it's like to work with you. And this was so great. So thank you so much for Fantastic. joining. It was a great convo. I loved it. Yeah, really, really great. Thank you so much. And our pets loved it too. <laughs> this conversation yeah, put my dog. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Allison. Bye.